everyone. I'm Associate Professor Sarah Weiss here at the Crawford School of Public Policy, and I'm really pleased to join you today in Bob and Ida's Environmental Impact Assessment class to talk about a very closely related field of study and work social impact assessment and to introduce you to an association very close to my own heart, the International Association for Impact Assessment. So I hope that today's short lecture will give you a sense of what social impact assessment is focusing on alongside environmental impact assessments and I'm going to talk you through a number of future trends and key issues that we see emerging as being central to the interests and also the future value of social impact assessment. And I really hope that this complements and enriches your understanding of EIA. And we'll start out with a bit of a broad question. What is impact assessment? My colleagues Angus Morrison Saunders, Jenny Pope, and their co-authors in 2017 undertook a study published in the Impact Assessment and Project Appraisal Journal that found that globally we can identify more than 48 different types of impact assessments, everything from environmental and social, as we know, to health, human rights impact assessment, which is something I'll touch on a little bit later and is being championed by my good colleagues at the Danish Institute for Human Rights, as well as things like environmental strategic impact assessment or SEIA, Strategic Environmental Impact Assessment, which uses GIS, global positioning and satellite data to map and monitor environmental impacts. There's something called Integrated Human Impact Assessment, which is very interpretive and really interesting. So there's all different types of bodies and groups and approaches to impact assessment that you won't even have a chance to get across um, in your entire degree, let alone in this course. I think it's really important though that you know that lots of impact ass assessment types exist and that there's an effort now to bring together those various streams and types of impact assessment so that we can get comprehensive data about projects, their negative impacts and their potential benefits. If we had to define impact assessment very broadly and regardless of specific type, it really goes to the things listed on the screen here. It's about delivering information. Impact assessment historically has arisen out of regulation. So 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the implementation of NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act in the United States. And this is really the foundational or historical home of formalized environmental impact assessment globally. And all other types of impact assessment grew from the NEPA Act and spread across the world. Wherever we see impact assessment, we hope that there is research that goes into it. It can certainly be used for evaluation, at least in the Australian context, as in many others. It's used for licensing of major projects. So this is a process that's part of the approvals process for mining and extractives projects, for example, or major electricity infrastructure for ports, for rail, for road. We see impact assessments across a large variety of major sectors. We'd certainly hope that impact assessment is representative, that it brings in a lot of different views and perspectives and really attempts to have a holistic understanding of the project or the policy at hand, because ultimately we want impact assessment of any type to support informed decision making. And my colleagues and I at the International Association for Impact Assessment, which I'll tell you more about in a moment, we believe very strongly that where impact assessment is done well, it has the opportunity to foster and advance sustainable development and to truly improve lives. And part of that requires consultation. And that's what I'm going to focus on with you today. So how does community engagement and the real social side of social impact assessment come into play? And what are the contextual trends shaping current approaches and concerns related to social impact assessment? We're going to look together at three trends, and I appreciate that I'm on the video today. I'm very sorry I couldn't be there with you, but hopefully you can hang with me. So we're going to look at three key trends shaping current and future social impact assessment practice. 
The first is digitization, the spread of social media, and most of you will have a phone in your pocket right now, so you know all about that, and AI. So we're going to look a little bit at how that's influencing community consultation and engagement in SIA. The second trend that I think is really relevant and related to consultation uh, is cumulative impacts. And I'll explain later exactly what I mean by that, but for now, just think about the layers and variety of projects that many communities in our, and uh, areas are experiencing all at the same time, cumulative impacts. And finally today, a trend that I think is important and also relates to how we engage with communities through SIA is this question of professionalization or potential certification of SIA practitioners as well as community-led social impact assessments. Before I move on to those topics, though, I would be remiss of me not to mention to you uh, the International Association for Impact Assessment. IAIA is the world's leading member network of impact assessment practitioners of all types and stripes, and I currently serve as global president until the end of this year, so it's, I'm very biased, but I think IAIA is terrific and that anyone interested in impact assessment, whether from a practitioner perspective or on the client side or on the government and regulation side, it's really a group that you should know about. IAIA holds an annual conference. Just this year, our annual conference was in Brisbane, and next year we'll be in Sevilla in Spain in May of 2020. And it's the organization's 40th anniversary, so it'll be a really special conference. If you're interested, we do have a special section within the association, and it's a big association. We have approximately 7,000 members in 120 different countries all of whom come to our conferences to learn about leading impact assessment guidelines and practice, but also to share cases. It's a really terrific community. We have a section called Students and Young Professionals, and I believe now the name of that has been changed to Students and Early Professionals, in recognition of the fact that some of you may have already had one or even multiple careers before you come to impact assessment practice. If you are early in an impact assessment career, and if this really interests you, I highly encourage you to check out IAIA. And Sango will give you the slides, and in all of these slides where I've shown documents or organizations, you'll find hyperlinks in the slides to these documents. So that's my spiel about IAIA. I hope to see you there. Oh, I've got one more thing. If you are going down the academic track relative to impact assessment, you may also wish to know that we have the Impact Assessment and Project Appraisal Journal. This is terrific even if you're not an academic because we do accept something we call practitioner papers, where if you've been involved in an impact assessment, or maybe you've tried a new method, or maybe you've just found something really interesting that you think others in the field would like to know about, we do accept practitioner papers as well as traditional style academic articles. So if any or more of this interests you or you'd just like to have a chat, I'm a huge fan of impact assessment and always happy to talk about it. For my international colleagues who might be using WeChat, by all means, my WeChat QR code is there. Uh, otherwise, if you're on Twitter, you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen my Twitter QR code. And we'll put these back up again at the end. Uh, if you scan those with your phone, you can get directly in touch with me and I'd welcome that. So, social impact assessment. What are some of the emerging issues? Here on the screen, you can see, how many do I have? Six, eight? Eight different emerging issues, and I'm sure that whoever you speak to, there would be different other more. Uh, but as someone working across the field and as someone who is involved in the editorial board of IAPA and seeing the different types of issues emerging around impact assessment today, these are the eight kind of distinctive areas that I think are worthwhile considering when we look at the future of social impact assessment. And you'll see there that we've got things that we're going to talk about together today, digital, social media, cumulative impacts, professionalization, and certification. 
You'll also see a couple of other points that we won't have time to talk about together today, but that may interest you. So there's a growing discussion now about how we create policy to manage impact assessment, particularly where we do have cumulative impacts. And I will touch on that a little bit later. How do we regulate impact assessment, especially with emerging technologies and new ways of doing things? How do we assess new and emerging markets? So in the United States, for example, there's a big conversation at the moment about how we might assess things like Uber using social impact assessment techniques. How do we assess shared economy like Airbnb? These are really interesting questions and they're opening up new fields and new ways of doing social impact assessment. And the final little circle there, you'll see SIA with Chinese characteristics. I work quite a bit in China and my colleagues and I there are asking some really interesting questions about how does impact assessment, particularly SIA, work in non-democratic environments where you have much more hierarchical and top-down decision making. There is still arguably a strong role for SIA. So how do we integrate that into these other types of governance systems? Again, there's so much here I could talk about, but what I wanna focus on today are issues affecting community engagement relative to SIA. So that first issue that I noted earlier is this idea of digital frontiers and social media. So you would have done some work with Sango around talking about identifying stakeholders for your impact assessment, or what we call setting out the scope or boundary of the assessment. And a major part of that step in the assessment is defining the local community, who is the affected community. With the advent, particularly of social media, connecting us all in ways never before possible, we're seeing some really interesting new questions about who is local? Who is an affected community? Which jurisdictions matter? Where do you draw the line around these things when you're trying to undertake an impact assessment for an issue that arguably has global implications? So this question of who is local becomes really important. If we believe that climate change is occurring, and I certainly do, I am arguably a global citizen with a clear and direct interest in any major project that might, for example, increase greenhouse gas emissions, that might, for example, extract more fossil fuels from below the ground. So who is local and how to assess that? This was an issue I first started to think about several years ago with my colleagues, Professor Helen Sullivan, who many of you will know is the director of the Crawford School, and our colleague, Professor Fiona Haynes at the University of Melbourne. We were exploring the idea of a social license to operate for coal seam gas in Australia. And in looking at the social and environmental implications of an emerging coal seam gas industry, we became aware that there was a very substantial conversation happening online. And so over the course of two years, we had a number of hit Twitter hashtags and Twitter handles that we had as a kind of search database and our poor research assistant, every two weeks, he would go on Twitter and he would download from Twitter using these search hashtags and handles in a special software program, all of the tweets that related to the coal seam gas debate within Australia. And we did this every fortnight, every Thursday for two years and collected close to 1 million tweets. In analyzing those tweets, one of the things that we were very interested in was where are people tweeting from? Is it just people in the Hunter Valley or Queensland who are protesting local CSG sites around their area? Or are there others who are becoming interested because of this social digital medium? What we find perhaps won't surprise you, but what you may wish to know, particularly if you're on Twitter, uh, is that as researchers, when uh, people send a tweet, it told us to the latitude and longitude from where that tweet had been sent. So we were then able to explore who's sending tweets, who's getting involved. And we looked at one of the key activist groups, many of you may know, Lock the Gate. Lock the Gate were extremely effective in using social media to gather together 
far broader geographic communities than would otherwise perhaps historically have been interested in a local project. And they were also able to use social media as a means to get people interested in protests and events online and then combine those with physical events. Now that's a little bit different to social impact assessment, but what's important here is that we could see what we think of as communities of interest involved in a particular geographically located site. And these were individuals who traditionally in social impact assessment would not have been defined as local and would not have been included in any assessment. We're also seeing, and I mentioned before, AI coming on stream. Uh, other uses of digitization and social impact assessment include a greater capacity to collect real-time data. CSIRO, which is, uh, for those of you from overseas, Australia's main scientific research organization, they have a group that looks specifically at social license to operate. And my good colleague, Dr. Kieran Moffat, now runs a spin-off company from that called Reflexivity. You might want to look it up. One of the things that they have developed are apps that individuals in affected communities can have on their phones and they can report data from their own community perspectives in real time about a particular project. So this has been used primarily with mining companies to date, but it's something very interesting. And I think this notion of real time data collection for social impact assessment and indeed for environmental impact assessment is something that we're going to see expand in the future. And that brings me to my next point. What else are we going to see in the future in regards to how communities are engaged around social impact assessment? A major trend is better attention to what we in the field call cumulative impacts. So this is where an individual or a particular community is experiencing the effects of multiple projects at one time. Now, why does this matter? Infrastructure projects are often the target of social impact and environmental impact assessments. The McKinsey Global Institute, and here you can see a link to their 2016 report, they have examined the infrastructure need globally, and they have found that in order to advance the sustainable development goals, in order for economies to emerge out of poverty, and in order for developed economies like Australia to meet our growing urbanization and population needs, there is globally currently a US $57 trillion infrastructure need. That is a lot of infrastructure. And we are seeing that in real life, in real time in Australia. Just yesterday, the Australian uh, Infrastructure Australia, so that's our peak industry body for infrastructure in Australia. They released their 2019 infrastructure audit. This is the first major infrastructure audit for Australia. It is a 700 page report, so maybe just read the executive summary if you're interested. It's their first infrastructure audit since 2015. And Infrastructure Australia have found that we have a $600 billion spending need just over the next 15 years in order to meet the basic infrastructure necessary to meet Australia's urbanization, population growth, and energy transition needs. That's a lot of infrastructure. And that 600 billion is in addition to the $250 billion of infrastructure already under delivery. And that's why at the Crawford School, I am really excited and very busy leading something called the Next Generation Engagement Program. So this research program is Australia's largest study into community engagement in infrastructure projects to date. We also believe that it is the largest study on these issues globally. And we're working with the G20's Global Infrastructure Hub to now start to internationalize our data to be able to do some comparisons. So NextGen is telling us a lot about the needs of communities and how community engagement can inform social impact assessment in a time of cumulative impacts. We have 23 different industry and government partners who work on the program of research with us, and many of those are governments. And that brings me to this slide here about regulations and policy. 
This links directly to the issue of cumulative impacts because historically, impact assessment policy and regulatory requirements have worked on a project by project basis. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're a community member in an urban area and there is a new road being put in. At the same time, perhaps there's a sewerage update project. And at the same time, perhaps, let's say that a 50-story office building or new residential building is being put in next door to your home. As a community member, you're experiencing a road project, you're experiencing a water project, and you're experiencing a major construction project. And you can probably imagine that you don't actually care which company or which government is doing which project, you just care that things are really noisy and inconvenient. Our policies and regulation don't really line up with that because there will be one assessment that's done for the road project, there'll be another assessment that's required for the water project, and probably yet another assessment that's done for the building project. And when we think about community engagement in a time of intensive project delivery with cumulative impacts, what that leads to is a policy or a regulation that requires consultations which are not community centric, which are not undertaken from a community member's perspective. And one of the big challenges facing social impact assessment in Australia at the moment is the situation in which communities are feeling consultation fatigue. And indeed stories and anecdotes that I'm hearing from the field tell me that individuals are saying to the assessors, look, you know, your project is okay. I don't really have any issues with it, but I am just so sick of being consulted that now I feel like I just want to oppose everything. And this is something that we're hearing from practitioners in the field pretty consistently across conversations. So that's anecdotal, so it's not real evidence, but I think it's interesting to note uh, that we certainly have an issue in Australia at the moment where social impact assessment needs to be better geared towards dealing with cumulative impact assessments if it's going to become more community focused and equally more community relevant. So that leads me to my little summary for this part, which is that our policies do not always reflect the ways in which communities experience major projects. And as someone who leads social impact assessment uh, and who's really pushing for best practice globally, this makes me very concerned about how we engage community members. For the most part, where communities are engaged in social impact assessment, they do so without any incentive other than being good citizens. Uh, they're rarely paid for their time uh, and certainly their expertise may or may not be valued as such. So one of the things that IAIA has been working on for several years now, um, the guidelines that you see on your screen were formally launched in 2015, are some best practice guidelines, which give advice not only about how SIA could be done really well, but also how stakeholders and community members should be engaged. The work that IAIA has done has really set a nice foundation for other state and territory governments to take up the mantle to develop their own guidelines. So the New South Wales Department of Environment and Planning, which indeed may have some other acronym or other name following May's big New South Wales election, uh, but DEP developed the Community and Stakeholder Engagement Guidelines, which are the green document that you can see here on the screen. This was developed by a good colleague of mine, Dr. Richard Parsons, who was also involved in the IAIA's broader SIA guidance. So there's some really, really good advice available now about how communities might best be engaged in this current intensive environment. And this leads me to my third and final trend. And I really appreciate you guys are hanging in there with me because I know it's a video, so don't fall asleep. The third trend is this question around professionalization or certification of social impact assessment and community-led assessments. So one of the things that we're concerned about is how can we ensure that the views reflected in impact assessment truly represent those of the community? 
the Danish Institute of Human Rights, which I mentioned earlier in this talk, as well as groups like Oxfam America, have been working really hard to develop toolkits and guidelines for ways in which communities themselves can lead impact assessments. And within IAIA, we have an important in initiative called Community Connect. Community Connect was the brainchild of Ana Maria Estevez, and what it does is it allows communities affected by projects to lodge a request with IAIA to say that they would like an SIA or EIA or Health Impact Assessment Practitioner to come to their communities to undertake an assessment on their behalf to provide them with research and evidence that they can then use in their discussions and negotiations with corporate or government clients. So there's a lot of push now towards communities themselves uh, collecting and owning social impact or human rights impact assessment data to use it for purposes of their own negotiations, opposition, or mediation. This then goes to a question of, you know, how do you trust your data? One of the ways that you trust impact assessment data is it's given to you by a professional. It's given to you by an expert. Social impact assessment struggles a bit here, though, because there is no required or specific qualification to be a social impact assessor. And indeed, and I'm sure Sango experiences this as a social scientist, I will often hear from people, oh, well, I can do interviews. I'm really good at asking questions. And you kind of think, yeah, that's not exactly, you know, what we do is a little more formal than that. But there's no qualification to say that. I don't have an engineering degree. I don't have a particular finance degree. And it's wonderful that many of you are receiving professional training in impact assessment through undertaking this particular course. But at the end of the day, you won't have a degree that says, I'm a social impact assessment practitioner. So amongst the professionals, and I'm going to just uh, hide myself, I think, for a second here so you can see this quote. Uh, amongst the professionals, we have been having a really active conversation in Australia about whether or not we do need more professionalization of social impact assessment practitioners. And there's a big question about whether a certification would be helpful. So as part of the Next Generation Engagement Program research, we have been measuring uh, for two years now in a national survey, the State of Infrastructure and Engagement Survey, a variety of issues around community engagement in infrastructure. And this year we focused on professionalization and we asked respondents, what do you think? If I held a tertiary degree specializing in community engagement, my colleagues from other disciplines like project management, finance, or engineering, would respect my work more. Now, here's what's interesting about this. When I talk to community engagement professionals in the field, they all say, oh yeah, we need a degree. We definitely need a qualification. But when you go out to survey and you ask a variety of people from different disciplines, you can see that the data is really split. And as a researcher that tells us we have more work to do here to really understand what is going to help to better professionalize and legitimize social impact assessment. So today, exactly the same percentage, 28% agree and disagree with the statement and a further just over one third aren't quite sure either way. So we've got some work to do. But we know it's a big question. And it's a big question because we are increasingly able to articulate the value of understanding social impacts. So again, in the State of Infrastructure and Engagement Survey, and these are our 2017 to 2018 results, we asked 123 professionals in Australia's infrastructure sector. So they're working across all different disciplines from engineers to community engagement what are the most influential factors affecting project delivery? And we gave them some choices. You know, is it access to technical expertise? Is it competition from other projects because of that cumulative environment that we talked about earlier? Is it technical issues? Is it funding? We often talk about the issues around funding, but the number one most influential factor affecting project delivery, timely and successful project delivery, is stakeholder and community pressure. SIA has a true value and it is so important that we deliver it professionally and we deliver it well.
So that's a really great message to end on. I sincerely appreciate your time and attention today. I hope that at some point in the future, I'll get to meet many of you in person taking classes at Crawford. I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, and please feel free to get in touch. Zango will give you a slide. Thanks so much, everybody. 